recently, so let's quiet it down for a minute. to know how long this is going to last. It's going to be five minutes.
you'd like to continue meditating, you can. And if you'd like to meditate with your eyes open, that's fine too. You've probably heard <coughs> that the Buddhist antidote to anger is goodwill, metta, loving kindness. And you may have tried it and found that there are times when it doesn't work. That no matter how hard you try, it's difficult to generate goodwill for the person who cut in front of you in traffic, whose decisions are affecting your life in one way or another. <coughs> And you may have come to the conclusion either there's something, something wrong with Buddhism or something wrong with yourself. And I'm here to tell you tonight that <clears throat> neither is the case. Actually, <clears throat> Buddhism has many other tools for dealing with anger. Uh, goodwill is only one of them. And it's important to understand that there's a whole array of tools that you can use to deal when anger comes up in the mind. I had a student one time who would bring her son in. She had an autistic, an autistic hyperactive child. Very difficult combination. <clears throat> Made more difficult by the fact that she was a princess from Thailand and her son was being raised by ladies in waiting, um, other people who tended to indulge the child. And as he was getting older, his, problem, his anger became a real problem. And so she brought him up to the monastery to have me teach him how not to be angry. And I had to explain to her, that's not the issue. It's The issue is what to do when you do get angry. If you're told not to get angry, then you're left helpless when anger comes. But realizing that anger is a natural response in the mind and that there are ways of dealing with it that help you overcome it so that it doesn't affect your actions, it's an important tool to have in your arsenal for basic survival. Um, a lot of the problem with anger or the understanding of the Buddhist approach to anger is many times we misunderstand the Buddhist culture or the attitude around anger. Um, we all know that Buddhism is very much like therapy in the sense the Four Noble Truths are like a doctor's prescription. There's suffering, there's a cause of suffering, um, the cessation of suffering, the path to the end of suffering. It's very much like a doctor's diagnosis. There are the symptoms of the disease, there is the cause of the disease. By attacking the cause of the disease, you put an end to it. And we often assume that Buddhism, therefore, would pretty much have a therapeutic attitude towards anger or an attitude that's similar to American therapy culture. That is, if you're angry, it's your problem. And that, of course, absolves everyone else in the world of responsibility for their actions, which is not a very, very skillful attitude towards anger. Um, actually, American therapeutic culture has two attitudes towards anger. One is if you have anger inside, you should let it all out. Don't let it bu get bottled up. I have an older brother who believes in that. He believes that if he bottles up his anger, he's going to get cancer. Hasn't been good for his married life. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I know other people who say, well, gee, you have to accept everything that comes your way and try to respond without anger. And that way you become a Buddhist doormat, neither of which <laughs> is, is a skillful approach to, to anger. Um, and the word skillful here is important. To understand any Buddhist teaching, you have to understand that the Buddha's basic distinction is between what's skillful behavior and what's unskillful behavior. And you have to apply that in all, all areas. There was once one of the Buddha's lay students who was approached by a person who says, what does your teacher teach? Does he teach that the world is eternal? Well, no. Does he teach that it's not eternal? Well, no. Infinite? No. Finite? No. Went down the whole list of what were the big psych philosophical issues in the day. And in each case, he said, and the, the lay student said, you know, the Buddha doesn't answer these questions. And the, per, and the person said, well, in that case, your teacher doesn't really teach anything at all, does he? And the lay student said, no, he, there is one important distinction he makes between what is skillful and what is unskillful. This lies at the basis of everything. You may call it dualistic, but it's a very useful dualism. You're being wheeled into, a, into an operating room. You want your surgeon to understand the distinction between skillful and unskillful. And it's also useful to have that distinction in mind in your own life. <clears throat> and the whole issue comes up in dealing with anger as well. Um, 
we're often taught that one of the basic Buddhist teachings is on acceptance, um, which can mean many things. It can either accepting the situation around you, or it can mean accepting your anger. Um, in either case, it's difficult to figure out exactly how you would balance that out, unless you have the distinction between skillful and unskillful behavior. Um, for one thing, I've never been able to find the Pali word for acceptance. I don't think they had such a word. So think about that for a while. <laughs> they did have the word for skillful and unskillful, but you don't see a Pali term for acceptance at all. Um, the Buddha often taught that there are problems in the mind in which you have to do something. The skillful response is to do something about it. And there are other times when the skillful response is to just watch. And unfortunately, he doesn't give any clear you know, ABC guidelines on how to do that. He does, however, give you guidelines on how to become the sort of person who can begin to make this distinction and be observant enough so you can start making coming to your own conclusions. And the issue of anger is a very a very important one here. Anger arises when something we see something wrong outside. There's either an injustice, um, discourtesy, disrespect. Um, dealing with the issue of disrespect I don't know about you, but many times I find Miss Manners has more wisdom than most Dharma books. Yeah. And she had a great column one time on um, the causes of crime, in which she said, you read the newspapers and you begin to realize the major cause of crime these days is senselessness. You know, there was another senseless shooting, there was another senseless robbery, senseless murder. And as she said, we used to have such good, sensible crime <laughs> over love or money. I mean, said, <laughs> Anything aside from love and money is senseless. However, she went on to say, however, if you look a little bit deeper, you begin to realize that a major cause of crime is, and you're not going to believe this, bad manners. And, and, you, you, and you hear people saying, well, they didn't show me any respect. They were dissing me. You know, there is a lot of disrespect out in the world, and people many times will commit crimes just based on that. Other times it's a deeper issue. I mean, real injustices are being done out there. And the question is, you know, what to do about it. Oftentimes we see a situation which we don't like, anger arises, and we try to think of something to do about the situation while the anger is still in the mind. And from the Buddhist perspective, the problem is not so much that we want to do something about the injustices, but we, we allow the anger to color our perception of the situation and our perception of what should be done. So it's not that the Buddha is telling us simply to accept things as they are and try to swallow your anger and, accept, and feel that you are to blame for the anger, rather than that you've got to deal with the anger in such a way that it doesn't get in the way of your responding in an appropriate way or a skillful way to what you see as wrong. <clears throat> Once you get the anger out of the way, there are two things that may happen. One, you may see that the situation was not as bad as you thought it was simply that your, your opinions had colored the situation. The other the thing might be that you can see that the situation really is that bad. Something should be done, and then the question is, what, when, where? In other words, what is the time and what is the place? What is the best thing to say in that time and place? So Buddhism is not saying that if you have anger that you're a bad person and you should, you know, it's, it's all your fault. Rather, it's saying that the anger is the unskillful element in the equation of what should be done, and you want to deal with that. The main problem with anger is that it tends to block out certain parts of the mind. And there's a kind of clarity that comes with tunnel vision, but it's, uh, it's an unfortunate clarity because many times after the action is done, you've got to get, live with the regret as your mind begins to open up and you say, that was really stupid. I shouldn't have done that. Um, we had a case in Thailand one time when two young men got into an argument and the Many times people think that people living in, in monasteries in Thailand deal with nothing but sweet Thai presence, you know, who are very pure and, and pure as the driven snow. One thing, they don't have snow in Thailand. Two, um, <laughs> in the village in which the monastery was, you know, there was, we had a murder. There was prostitution, there were drugs, there was promiscuity, um, all kinds of stuff going on. At any rate, this young mo these two young men got into an argument one night, and one of them stalked off and went home got his sickle, laid in wait behind a tree, and waited for the other man to come home, head home. As the other man headed home, not knowing that the other person was hiding behind the tree, of course, um, they got into a scuffle. The man with the sickle almost beheaded the other guy. Um, 
and then stuffed him in a burlap bag, dragged him down into a into a <clears throat> into a reservoir. And at that point, probably realized that he'd done something very stupid. Um, and many of us here don't <clears throat> go to the extent of murdering the people that we're angry about, but there is that potential in the human heart. You have to work, watch out for it. Um, so we've got to get the anger out of the way, because many times, as the Buddha said, in fact, this is one of his reflections to help us deal with anger, is that when you get under the power of anger, you will many times do the things, precisely the things that your enemy would wish to see you do. You know, an enemy likes to see would like your enemy would like to see you ugly when you're angry you're ugly he would like to see you destroy your friendships many times under anger under the power of anger you destroy your friendships he would like you to act in ways that go against your own advantage many times when you're angry you get things mixed up what looks like would be good for you turns out to be something else and vice versa so the dangers of anger are real but this does not mean that acting on injustice has those same in, same dangers. It's simply a question of getting the anger out of the way and then looking at the situation appropriately. So this is the Buddhist attitude towards anger. It's not that you know if things are bad and you're angry about them, it's your fault, rather than that if you want to give an appropriate response to a bad situation, you have to get the anger out of the way and then you can see things more clearly. <clears throat> the series of tools that are useful for that one of, them, one of which I just stated, um, is to help get rid of that tunneling of your tunnel vision that makes a particular a- action seem like just precisely the thing you want to say in that situation or precisely the thing you want to do. Um, you have to step back a bit to make sure that you know, certain brain synapses have not been cut off to make that decision. The synapses that get cut off are two qualities that the Buddha said are the protectors of the world. One is a sense of shame. Now, shame here does not mean being ashamed of yourself. It means looking at a possible action that you might do and realizing that that's beneath you. It's something you just feel was below your values, below your sense of who you are. And this protects you from a lot of things. It's a very useful attitude to have. Um, And you realize shame here is not so much having a low self-opinion of yourself. It's, It's actually having a fairly high opinion of yourself, realizing that certain actions are beneath you. They're just not really worthy of you. The second attitude, which is a protector, is something they call otapa, it's a Pali term, which means fear of the consequences of your actions. Again, this is a very useful fear. You realize that you do something and you're going to regret it for the best of your life, you don't want to do it. Now, the problem is that these two attitudes or these two qualities of mind are precisely the ones that get cut off when anger comes in. You find it easy to do and easy to say things that otherwise in your right mind you would never even consider doing. So what you've got to do is to get rid of that tunneling. And the Buddha has you look at things in a larger perspective. The Buddha mentions that the attitudes that are worth developing in the mind to deal with anger, he says that all four of what are called the Brahma Viharas. Now, metta, or goodwill, is one of them. But another important one that he has you reflect on is equanimity. And equanimity is the We often think of as just simply being accepting or in having no reaction at all, but that's not what equanimity means. It means looking at things in the larger perspective, getting a sense of your priorities, what's important, what's not important, and particularly reminding yourself of the fact that when you do something, it's going to have consequences in the larger term. And so in order to remind yourself of that fact, the Buddha has has you look at the human situation from a larger perspective. One of his passages for dealing with anger against someone is to think, okay, this person has done something against me or something has done something bad to me in the past. What should I expect? This person has done something bad to people I love in the past. What should I expect? This person has done something good to people I hate. What should I expect? Uh, And then so on. Then from the past tense, he brings it into the present tense. This person is doing same three actions, either bad things to me, bad things to people I like, good things to people I hate. What should I expect? This is the human condition. Are you going to ask the entire human race to do good things to you, good things to the people you like, bad things to your enemy? You're in the wrong human condition. You're in the wrong place. <clears throat> the world doesn't act that way. Um, and ultimately, and the final reflection he says is, resolving not to get worked up over impossibilities. 
precisely this. You cannot expect everyone in the world to act in a pleasing way or act into a, in a good way. Again, this is not simply saying, well, I just should let the world be as it is, but it's to remind you that injustice is not an extraordinary thing in the world. It's, and because it's not extraordinary, it doesn't give you extraordinary rights to do and say as you like without thinking about the consequences. This is an important thing to reflect on. <clears throat> Because many times when you're angry, you know, there's a little injustice, and it's the biggest thing, it's the worst thing that anyone has ever done, the most outrageous thing that anyone has ever done. And it's useful for the respect, and, it, and it's a strange thing. I always thought for a while it was very strange with any of these emotions, like anger or grief, to think that this is a universal part of the human condition. You'd think, my gosh, that makes it even worse. Everybody's dying, everybody's injustice, suffering injustice. But when you back up a little bit, it makes you realize, okay, it's not just you. One of the hardest questions that people ask when there's injustice in the world was, why me? And the answer is because everybody suffers this. And, some, and it's amazing, but that does help lighten the burden a little bit. It also reminds you, as I said, that because injustice is not extraordinary, it doesn't give you extraordinary rights to go and bomb Baghdad. You, know? you have to think, okay... Con other people's actions have karma, cons karma consequences. Mine will have karma consequences as well. When you step back in that way, it begins to put the situation into a better perspective. And then the question comes, okay, what is the best thing to do right now? Am I in a mental state where I can perceive that? If not, you've got to look at the anger. Looking at the anger, um, it's important to divide the anger into, into three parts. <clears throat> There's the actual anger as a mental state. There's the object of the, men, the object of the anger. And then there's the physical reaction in your body that comes from the anger. Our problem is that we tend to glom all of these three together. They all seem to be part of one, one and the same thing. And it's important in, in, all, in looking at any Buddhist teachings on anything, you realize the Buddha has two ways of looking at an issue. One is analyzing things into their, into their component parts. And then the second way is to see things in terms of causal, causal relationships. And in dealing with anger, you've got to do both approaches. First, as I said, taking the three apart. Um, in dealing with anger, many times you find the easiest thing to deal with is the physical reaction first. And many times this is the most dangerous part of it because you know, your heart is racing, you know, your stomach is all churned up, and you've just, quote-unquote, got to get it out of your system. And our, many times we think getting out of it, your system means you know, striking back, saying, oh, I'd really like to say this, this is my chance to tell my boss off, after all, he's been a real bastard. Um, and then, of course, you regret it <laughs> for many weeks down the line. Um, but it's that sense of physical displeasure, the physical discomfort that comes with the anger, that's where you've got, it, got to get it out of your system. This is where breath meditation comes in. Now, Larry and I have had long arguments about breath meditation on the issue of whether you should be allowed to play with your breath or not. And I say yes. Larry says, um, Cambridge people tend to play too much. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, it's useful to know that by breathing a certain way, you can calm down your heart rate. Breathing a certain way, you can breathe through any sense of tension in your body that comes along with the anger. Um, and this is one way that you can prepare yourself for dealing with anger when it strikes, is when you're sitting and meditating, find out what ways of breathing will have different physiological effects. Um, what ways of being sensitive to your body in the sense that there are patterns of tension here and there in the body, how do you breathe through them so that they don't, you know, they don't oppress you? And you can actually get them out of your system without having to yell at somebody, without having to, to hit somebody. Um, in traditional Thai medicine, there is a belief that your energy channels, negative energy, should be let out your hands and your feet. So you might think of the tension, any tension that's building up in your body, think of it going out your hands, out your feet. Um, I had a very peculiar experience with this one time. There was a man who, uh, studying with my teacher. He was a retired Air Force general. He had fought in the Korean War and apparently had killed a number of people in the war, came back to Thailand, and the remainder of his life was spent trying to make sure that he was going to be a stream enterer before he died so that he wouldn't have to go to hell for all those murders he did in, in, in the war. And he was a very avid meditator. I mean, it's an interesting motivation. Um, 
but it seemed to work. He really meditated very hard. And one day he was sitting under my hut. You know, in Thailand, huts are built up on these stilts, and he was talking to a few people, discussing the Dharma, and this strong sense of energy, he said it was almost unbearable, just sort of building up in him as he was talking. And he didn't know what to do. And it just so happened that at that point I happened to walk past. And so he grabbed hold of me. I felt it. It went up my arm, down up my legs. It was like I was like a lightning rod for him. Um, but I began and but it did teach me a lesson. These energy channels they talk about, you know, they really exist. And so when you when you find that there's that tension and that the heart is racing, think of ways of breathing to breathe through the tension. Get it out your system that way. That way you can attack the anger from the kind of from the back door. Because when there's no longer that feeling of oppression inside the body, you can actually look at the metal state and look at the object of your anger and, and see them in a much calmer light. Actually look at the situation for what it is, because you've taken that element out. Other times you find that you can actually deal, deal directly with the anger. You can look at the state in the mind and realize, this is a very unpleasant state to have in my mind. If you have good will for yourself, why are you burdening yourself with this anger. I'll get back to this issue in a, in a moment. And you find that you, as you think through the situation, it's really not as bad as you thought it was, but your heart is still racing. Now, many times people will misread this as saying, well, I must still be angry. You remember, anger is a mental state. It's not a physical state. You churned up those hormones in your body. They have not left your bloodstream. Of course, the heart is still going to be racing for a while. Of course, there's going to be physical reactions. But don't think that just because the physical reaction is there that the mental state is still there as well. Many times the mental state is gone, and it's just a matter of letting things calm down on their own. So you can attack the anger either from the physical side through breathing through the tension, or if you found that it's, you've attacked it through the mental side and it's gone, don't misread the physical symptoms. It's kind of, it's kind of the residue of the anger, and then you breathe through them and get rid of them. Another way of dealing with the anger is to look at the object of the anger as separate from the anger itself. And this is the point where you might want to look at this person's actions and um, get a better perspective on them. Is this person worthy of my being angry? And sometimes it seems it is, and other times you say, well, no, it's not really worth it. And that's when you can actually begin to spread goodwill to that person. Before you spread goodwill to other people, though, spread good, some goodwill to yourself. As I said, you know, if you're letting yourself get worked up about the anger, if you're just feeding on the anger, you're not really feeding yourself well. You know, the mind does have this tendency to feed. In fact, the Buddha said that's the de definition of suffering, is the mind's feeding on the five aggregates, in which in this case are feelings, perceptions, thought constructs. Um, you've got bad food. This is junk food for the mind. And... Ask yourself, would I like to be? If you could take a picture of the mind feeding on the anger, what kind of picture would it be like? You know, is it sort of a picture of yourself that you would like to pass around to your friends? Or it's not really. And so, as you divide the anger into these three components, you begin to see that you know the connections that you that seem so strong. As you take them apart, all of them begin to weaken. You begin to look at the object strictly as an object of the anger in and of itself, without any without connect, necessarily connecting it to the anger. The anger is a mental state, the anger is a physical state. You begin to see divisions between them. And as they get divided, the strength of the three, each the strength of each one, instead of building on one another, they begin to fall apart. Um, that's when you can decide what should be done. You're in a better position to see things for what they are. You can ask yourself, is now the time and place to say something? If you haven't been able to wrestle the anger down, you say, well, not yet, okay? No matter how much I might feel like saying something, I'll have to wait to some other time. Or if you see that there is something that should be said, should be done right now, you're in a much better space. The mind has opened up a little bit. It doesn't have that same tunnel vision, which was blocking off your sense of, your sense of shame and your fear of the consequences of the action. Um, and then if you have time, you can start looking at another aspect of the anger, is, which is anger as a cause and effect process. You know, where did this anger come from? Why do you want to feed on it? The Buddha said you don't really understand something until you understand two very important things about it. One is seeing the drawbacks, and 
it's pretty many times the drawbacks of anger are obvious after the fact. And the other thing is seeing the allure. Allure. I mean, why do you like being angry? And this is the part of the process which probably demands the most honesty. We don't like to think of ourselves as a sort of person who really enjoys being angry, but if it weren't there, we wouldn't do it. Something within us really you know, gets a good kick out of, hey, I finally said what I wanted to say, or I've got, a, I've got a real emotion here, I've got a real passion here, my life suddenly has some color. Um, whatever the allure is, you've got to look for that. And it varies from person to person. Um, sometimes you know, some people you know, feel that it's their, it's their sign of, I'm a real warrior type, I'm not a wimp, I can stand up for myself and hold, on, hold my own. Um, you know, real warriors don't go around proving that they're warriors, you know? In fact, they try to hide the fact. Because it's one of the worst things you can do is let other people know that you've got, you've got a few tricks up your sleeve like that. Um, <laughs> years back, someone gave me a biography of Eisenhower, um, which I thought was a strange thing to do. Uh, <laughs> As I said, many times, you know, reading, reading non-Dharma books, you actually get more Dharma than you do in a lot of Dharma books. And this biography actually had a very important lesson. During the 1950s, when everybody was rattling sabers about you know, the communist threat and what everybody had to do about this threat, um, you know, we had to attack here, we had to attack there, Eisenhower kept saying no. And he was probably the only person in the country who would have gotten away with that. You know, after all, he'd proven himself in World War II. He didn't have to go out and prove himself that, you know, He's not the sort of person who was uh, st- staying in the Texas National Guard during a certain war <clears throat> <laughs> and suddenly had to prove some points. Um, and he'd shown himself that he wasn't a coward. And he kept us out of a lot of wars during the 1950s, precisely because he realized that you know, these battles cannot be won. Um, this is not the time to fight. And that's the sign of a true warrior, so pick, you know, picking your battles when to fight, when not to fight. And so for sometimes many of us, you know, when anger comes, that's our chance to show that we're a real fighter, that we're not a wimp. But you know, think about it. You know, there's, a, there's a time and a place for reactions, and you want to make sure that your reactions are skillful and that you choose your battles wisely. So, so go, look, look at the issue of you know, why you like being angry, what thrill, what allure you find in the anger. Look for that. And many times you'll find that that will undercut any desire to act on the anger. So when you look at this, you realize that the Buddhism, you know, Buddhism offers many different tools for dealing with anger, not just the issue of goodwill. I mean, there is that famous story in the canon where the Buddha said, if thieves are savagely cutting you limb from limb with a two-handled saw, you, know, you should you know, start with goodwill for them. I have a student out in Thailand, uh, out in out in San Diego, who whenever she reads anything in the Pali Canon she doesn't like, she goes ballistic, and she went ballistic over this one. Um, and what is the Buddha telling us? He's basically teaching you a parable, okay? Uh, and you remember it much more easily than the Buddha says. If th- people say nasty things to you, you know, spread goodwill to the, 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 the nasty person, okay? Good. You don't remember that. He says, if people are cutting you limb from limb with a two-handled saw, you know, spread goodwill for them. You, you, you remember that. You know? <laughs> and secondly, you realize, okay, you know, if, if your boss is yelling at you or your partner is yelling at you, it could get worse. Okay, This is not the worst thing that anyone has done in the world. Um, one of my favorite stories in the canon is of a monk who was going off to a very savage part of India. And the Buddha said, you know, the people there are pretty rough. You know, what if they yell nasty things at you? And the monk said, well, I'll, remember, I'll remember, remind myself that these are very civilized people and that they're not hitting me, okay? He said, what if they hit you? He said, I'll remind myself these are very civilized people and they're not stabbing me okay? with a knife. What if they stab you with a knife? Said, well, I'll remind myself these are very civilized people they're not killing me. Well, what if they kill you? He says, other people have committed suicide. At least my death won't be a suicide. That's the end. <laughs> So remember that, okay? It, it helps keep, you know, sort of the day-to-day irritations in perspective. So, so the Buddha does, though, teach you to have goodwill as one of the techniques for dealing with anger. But he reminds you there are others as well. The one about thinking about if acting under the power of anger, you're doing precisely what your enemy would like you to do. Now, this one, this 
the psychology of this reflection is not one based on goodwill for your enemy, okay? It's based on, I hate that bastard. I don't want to satisfy him. Okay? Which is a realistic way of dealing with the psychology of anger. I mean, if you're really angry at that person, the first thing is, oh, I should think goodwill for this person. May he be well. May he be happy. Whatever. Think, I don't want to give him the satisfaction of seeing myself destroy myself, okay? That's a good way of sort of using the psychology of anger to get out of anger. Once you've kind of gotten out in fresh air a little bit, then you can start thinking in broader terms about you know, the fact that you have probably angered other people in the world so that the fact that you're getting angry right now is not one of the major injustices of, of the human race. However, if there are situations which really are unjust, where you really need to make a difference, okay, you want to make sure that your difference has been handled well. Again, this is why reflecting on the sort of universality of injustice is not to make you give up, but it's to remind you that the reason there's so much injustice in the world is that someone else said, well, this person has been unjust, therefore I have the right to you know, whatever. And that, of course, breeds more injustice because it wasn't, an, it wasn't a skillful reaction. But if you realize, okay, it is ordinary for there to be injustice in the world, but this time I want to do it skillfully. I want to respond skillfully, so at least to help break the cycle. And when you can think in those terms, then you can have more, give more energy to the, or more conviction to your dealing with anger. Learning to analyze the anger first in terms of what its three parts are, the physical side, the mental side, and the actual object of the anger as three separate things, and then taking them on separately rather than taking them on all at once. And then also looking at the causal pattern, you know, exactly what inside you likes you, you know, makes you want to feed on the anger, give you a sense of you know, anger is a good thing, it's a good thing to get it out of my system, whatever those you know, unskillful thoughts are, what kind of allure they have, why you like feeding on them. When you can approach the anger in this way, it makes you much more effective in dealing with situations as they arise. Um, you're much less likely to destroy friendships, much, li- much less likely to um, breed the cycle of you know, continued you know, unskillful responses in the world. So as the Buddha is saying, he's not asking you to be a milk toast. He's not asking you to be a do- doormat. Um, years back, my teacher had a student who was a seamstress, and she was she had a customer come into her store one day, and the customer knew that she was a practicing meditator, and so she asked the price of certain dresses or things that the seamstress could make, and the seamstress quoted her prices and. The other person said, well, gee, you're, you're a practicing Buddhist. Why are you charging so much? You know? Shouldn't you, you know, try to keep things sort of you know, cheap, you know, cheap and inexpensive and not asking you know, for a big markup like this? And the seamstress said she knew that wasn't a big markup. It was a perfectly fair price, but she didn't know how to respond. So she went to see my teacher, and she said, what should I say in a case like that next time? And as my teacher said, well, tell that person, look, I'm not practicing the Dharma in order to be stupid. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> You know, when there is injustice in the world, when people are treating you unfairly, you don't want to just roll over. But, I mean, if it is the time to roll over, okay, roll over skillfully. If it's not the time to roll over, okay, respond in, the, respond in another way that's skillfully. But make sure you're in the right mental state for knowing what is the skillful and what is the unskillful thing to do at that time and that place. Once you get this, once you clear up the issue like this, and you see that on the one hand, the Buddhist attitude towards anger is a very realistic one based on the fact that there, you know, genuine, there is genuine suffering in the world. Um, but one of the great ironies of life is that we are also causing more suffering for ourselves by our unskillful reaction to what's going on in the world. So when he has you focus on your, your own inner problems like this, it's not saying that you're the one to blame, simply that if you want to deal effectively outside, you've got to take care of some stuff inside first. Clean up the mess inside, clean up the unskillful attitudes inside, then you can respond in an appropriate way outside. You can also see that in dealing with the anger, there are many more tools in your toolbox than simply trying to spread goodwill to this other person. Um, reminding yourself of the drawbacks of acting on anger, particularly you know, that you know, whoever's treating you unjustly will be happy to see you act on your anger. And you often find that many times that diffuses a situation right there. Someone comes at you in an angry way, you don't respond with anger. They don't know how to react. It's a game many people play, and they know the moves. Okay, I, I say this, and this person's going to have to say that. 
but you don't. That right there many times knocks them off their feet. But you can also, you know, think in terms of equanimity in terms of the sort of the general scheme of things. And as I said, equanimity is not simply accepting things. It means having a sense of priorities. Okay, what do I have to accept? What can I not change? If I if there are things that cannot be changed, why should I waste my energy on them? Each of us has only a limited amount of energy. Let's focus the energy on things where we really can make a change, make can make a constructive difference. This is the teaching of equanimity. Not simply being blasé or indifferent about things. It means having a very clear sense of priorities and learning to distinguish you know, what you can do and what you can't do. So when you have this when you see that you know the Buddha's attitude towards anger, and it really is a very helpful, very skillful one, and that the Buddha also gives you many more tools. Learn how to use the tools, both sort of in the in the trenches, you know, when you're actually confronted by someone doing something that makes you angry, and also preparing yourself beforehand. You know, many times when we're meditating, you think of the mind is just so pure. How could it ever give rise to anything else again besides these nice pure mental states? Well, you know, come on, you know, it's got the potential. When the mind is in a clear state, you start thinking about these things. You know, how am I going to be prepared the next time someone you know curses me? Whatever. And remember that many times the skills you learn on the meditation cushion are precisely the ones that you need to use when anger comes up. And learning to be in touch with your breath is a very skillful one, because many times someone says something and it, it strikes you the wrong way, but you've been so busy or so distracted that you haven't paid much attention. But it's there. And in, if you're tense, sensitive to your breath, you'll see it. That'll alert you, so you don't have to wait until at the end of the day when you realize that there's something very, very wrong with you as you're coming home shaking. Um, you learn to deal with it right away, simply by breathing through the tension, looking at the situation. So those are some of the thoughts on dealing with anger. Um, originally, I thought I was going to introduce this talk by saying several stupid things to get everybody angry to see, angry to see <laughs> what your reactions were. <laughs> But someone reminded me that that would not be very skillful. Uh, <laughs> so I guess I'll end the talk here. Now I'm supposed to give you five minutes to get out of here, if anyone who wants to get out. <laughs> so, so you have your five minutes. <laughs> Stay for the discussion. Okay. There are cushions over here now, as you are on the sidelines. <laughs> but, okay. Okay. okay, are there any questions? Yes. To me, I think the major attraction or allure of anger is the feeling of energy and mm-hmm. power that comes with it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That it's often seemed to me that the times I've actually been able to look at it, there is. Um, it seemed that if there were some way to separate the energetic <laughs> component from it, mm-hmm. from the ne- the negative emotional mm-hmm. aspect of it. Mm-hmm. This would be really marvelous to be uh-huh. able to do because there is simply a force to it mm-hmm. that um, is so much more powerful than any than the sort of feelings of of goodwill or in uh, the sort of more kinder emotions, mm-hmm. let's mm-hmm. say, that come mm-hmm. up. Mm-hmm. Um, but that remains, for me at least, an idea that oh, gee, wouldn't it be great to find a way of doing this? Mm-hmm. 
I must admit I don't have the faintest idea of yeah. how to begin. Well, it's, it's one of those states of energy which if you actually, can you think of yourself you know, holding on to that energy for about 20 minutes? How would it feel? Mm. You'd be exhausted. Mm-hmm. So it's... Um, so basically you're really, you're really draining yourself by letting that energy come. It's not that pleasant. If you actually looked at it, Sort of, you know, from a from a more sort of detached point of view, he'd realize, okay, there there is a certain thrill to get <clears throat> that blood right through the system, but you, you couldn't sustain it for very long. It does bring a sort of um, mental uh, mental clarity at times, or at mm-hmm. least things mm-hmm. seem to be very. That's that's the problem. That's this is this is, <laughs> that's that's the tunnel, you know. Ah, I see. What you're yeah. saying. Okay. You know, it's a complicated situation. All of a sudden, all you see is just that one little detail. And you see it very clearly. Okay. I, um, I have to admit, before I was a monk, I, I smoked pot, and I inhaled. <laughs> <laughs> and and before I was a meditator, I always thought that pot gave great clarity. You know, you saw something, you saw certain things really, really clear. You know? And then after I started meditating, I remember my I was visiting my brother, and he offered me a little one day, and I said, "Well, let's see what this is like. You know, why is this?" You know. Why is this against one of the fifth, one of the precepts? And I began to realize that clarity is precisely this issue. So many parts of your mind gets just shut down, and you're focused on one thing. You know, so it's the clarity of an, clarity of an amoeba. You know, amoebas see one thing very clearly. You know, <laughs> where the food is, food. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they have a lot of energy devoted to this food, and it's so that's a lot of what you know. The appeal of the anger is it seems clear. It seems to be very energetic. But when you open up your brain a little bit, you realize it's, it's a very distorted perception. Yes? I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the breath um, that you referred to. And I, I'm, I've been reading your book, Meditations, which mm. I thank you for. And mm-hmm. I've learned a lot from it. Huh. But what has been surprising to me about the book, and you referred to it again, is the notion of not just observ- observing the breath, but actively engaging the breath mm-hmm. and using it in yeah. various ways. Mm-hmm. Um, could you say a little bit more about uh, how you go about uh, uh, playing with playing the breath? Playing with the breath, yeah. To, to mm-hmm. the breath. Okay. Um, well, it's, you know, working with the breath is one very direct way of showing goodwill for yourself. And it's also a very good way of sensitizing yourself to the relationship between the mind and the body. I mean, this is what insight basically comes down to, is seeing these, inter, these, these um, interrelationships. And the best way to see a relationship is to play with the variables. So if I breathe this way, what happens? If I breathe that way, what's going to happen? Um, it also sensitizes you to the fact that often, already subconsciously, we are manipulating the breath. And if you tell yourself, well, I'll just simply sit here and allow the breath to happen on its own, that manipulation goes underground where you can't see it. So what you do is you consciously bring it up. Actually, when you say that, do you mean like breathe fast, breathe slow? Breathe long, breathe short, short. breathe deep. Think of different parts of the body in, involved in the breathing. Um, if you look at the breath process, you'll see that many of us use only certain parts of our body to breathe. They get kind of, those parts get overworked, other parts are not participating at all. And you can just think of, okay, well, you know, suppose my legs could breathe. What would that feel like? My arms could breathe. My, you know, I could breathe in through the back of the neck, brown down from the top of the head. And you realize that, you know, it would change your changing your perception of how the breath process works. Also changes how you actually breathe. And that makes you calls into question. Well, my preconceived notions of how the breath was working, you know, they must have been forcing certain breath patterns in my body, which may or may not have been very helpful. And so in this way you see how perception affects the form of the body, these physical processes. And at the same time, you know, as I said, it's a way of showing goodwill for yourself. You give yourself a nice, comfortable place to stay. If you're going to be sitting here for an hour, you know, nobody's going to know if you're playing with a breath, okay? I don't know how many people have asked me, said, can I really do that? You know? Am I allowed to do that? You know? 
Of course you're allowed to do that. And even if you weren't, how could they enforce it? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and as you're sensitizing yourself to the body in this way, you find that you can, you can create a place where it's really good to stay. And you can stay there for long periods of time. And precisely what you're trying to do in concentration practice is bring the mind to a stable state. And it's not going to want to stay there if you're beating it. It's like a child in a house. You know, if you treat the child well, you can open the windows and doors. The child's not going to run away. If you close the windows and doors and beat it, it's, it's going to find a crack. It's going to find an opening. It's going to go. And so you have this opportunity to get the mind on good terms of the breath, on good terms of the body. And you learn that the breath has a lot of uses like this. You know, when you're ill, there are certain ways of breathing that help the illness, or actually help you overcome the illness. Um, when you're tense, when you're tired, there are ways of breathing that help you overcome those issues. It's, the breath is a resource that we have that very rarely gets cultivated, and very, we very rarely make full use of it. So it's, you're thinking of the length, the depth of the breath, whether it's shallow, deep, um, light, heavy, down your back, down the front. Um, and again, it's not just the air coming in out of the lungs, it's kind of the whole energy flow through the body. And as you sensitize yourself to that, it helps you inhabit your body more and more comfortably so that when you, know, you want to practice mindfulness in daily life, you've got a good place to stay. It's easy to stay, it's attractive. And we were talking earlier about the mind's tendency to feed. You can give it some really good food just with a breath. And that helps you look. When you look at anger coming along, you say, really, this is junk food. I don't need this. I've got something much better to feed on. This is one of the attractions of anger. You're sitting there starving, and anger seems to give you something to feed on. It's, it's like a Big Mac. You know, you're gonna have <laughs> it's going to give you troubles down the road. You know? <laughs> so. Any other questions? Yes. feels more justified. Yes. And, and I don't know quite how to okay. get it to subside. Well, it, it's basically the same techniques. It's, this doesn't mean not seeing the injustice. Well, often with times, we, you know, again, we get, we get these things confused in our minds. You see injustice and you get anger, and it seems to be part of the same, same nexus. And you've got to realize, okay, seeing injustice and acting on it does not require the anger in the middle. We often think it does. That's what energizes us. Is I'm really going to go out there and you know. But then we see, you know, that we we see political candidates who've letting their anger get get control, you know, <laughs> and it, you know, they're shooting themselves in the foot, you know. And you've got to realize, okay, I can act on this. I can stay focused. I don't need the anger. And you're know, seeing the injustice and seeing the need for something to be done does not mean you necessarily has to be has, has to be an anger in the equation. So many times the techniques, okay, the anger, that, that sense that, you know, the physical sense of anger that comes, you can work with that. And then you can start looking at the mental state in and of itself. Okay, is this a helpful mental state to have? You know, there's, it's, there's delusion involved in it, there's a strong sense of discomfort, and a strong, you know, it's very easy to do the wrong thing when you have that anger, even though it feels energizing and you feel focused. Like we were saying earlier, it's not... It's a false focus. It's a false energy. It can't be sustained. So when you see injustice, you've got to say, okay, breathe through the physical reactions, look at the mental state of anger, try to step back from it a little bit, then act. Yes? Yeah. I'm, I'm worried that I'm 
some level, that was a suicidal leap to go in there. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about um, the other story you told where you were saying that, you know, if somebody has acted in a certain way, what can I expect? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the question is not just about the story, it's also about um, developing this sort of discernment about when to enter into a situation where you're encountering hunger mm -hmm. and when it's wiser to actually go away. Mm -hmm. And when that's more about goodwill towards self and mm -hmm. Well, the, the end of the story was that he actually went and he converted the country. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, and it was his fearlessness that enabled him to act in a skillful way. Yeah. Um, also, you know, I must say, you know, part of monk culture is, you know, I don't have a family after support. I don't have all these other responsibilities. You know, if something happens to me, it's not that big. An issue. Um, if you have you know, personal ties, you have to think about those personal ties, and then you have to weigh. Okay, is, I mean, if you know, if I haven't, if this move is going to help my practice, go ahead and go for it. If this move is just a stupid suicidal move that's going to you know step me back for a long time, don't go. You know? And that's a question of personal discernment. So I mean, the Buddha didn't tell everybody to you know go out and you know running at tigers and things. But if you happen to encounter a tiger, you know you want to practice keeping your mind under control. Yeah. Well, glad to know the real yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, there's you know there's a difference between being fearless and being foolhardy, and that's one of those differences you can only learn through practice. But no, we're not asking you to be suicidal. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I find this scenario keeps coming up more and more for me in the last, say, like a year or so. Um, um, like for instance, I'll be, I'll get into a conversation with someone. Um, it would be like a few different people, but people fairly close to me and people I converse with quite often. So, like for example, I'll be on a phone call with someone. know going into the phone call that many of the previous phone calls have ended up with me feeling very frustrated and like my buttons were pushed and mm -hmm. feeling angry and tense afterward. So I will in between half not want to make the phone call but half you know just wanted to go ahead and make it anyway. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway I'll, I'll have this mindset I go in and try to be open minded and end up at the end of the phone call feeling like my buttons were pushed and I got all caught up in something that didn't even feel like it was a lot to do with me. It was a person telling a story over and over again and just in the end I, I end up feeling super frustrated and then find that I feel angry at myself for getting into that same scenario and having those feelings again and it doesn't feel like it's about one particular person, so it feels more like I'm letting myself get drawn in, and, and then the anger feels like it, it stays in there, mm -hmm. you know, um, until at some point it goes away. Well, before you, before you make the phone call, meditate for a little bit. Deal with the breath, as I was recommending over here. And then throughout the phone call, stay with your breath. Ask yourself, what are the expectations you have placed on this person? And of course, the person is not living up to those expectations. Then ask yourself, look, am I in the National Bureau of Standards? I mean, does she have to live up, to, or he have to live up to my expectations? This is the way that person is. And so I'm going to sit here and meditate through this phone call. And when you see a button being pushed, just kind of breathe right through it. I had a student in Singapore one time who said every day at, after the end of uh, jo he came home from his work, he had to sit down and meditate for a while just to sort of he felt that during the, the day he had been like a trash can and people were throwing trash into him and he had to come home and empty it out. And the trick is to cut a hole in the bottom of the trash can you know, so that when things come in, they just go out the other side. And so you realize it's your expectations that are the catching element there. So it's okay, this is the way this person is, you know. 
I know this person well. I know this person has these the skill in pushing buttons. Okay, well, just you know, watch that happen, and try to get yourself out of the way. Some questions over here? Yes. Um, I guess there are different types of anger, mm-hmm. but I'm wondering if you think that um, one type of it, anyway, is a way of the uh, of reinforcing a sense of self. Mm-hmm. Oh, very much so. Stronger. Very much so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all, although, I mean, it's very difficult to talk to somebody uh, you know, like this, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, you, you, know, you know, do what works in the situation. <laughs> yes. Okay, impatience with the other person or impatience with yourself? It's hard to distinguish between the two, but the impatience mm-hmm. as an energy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Force. Mm-hmm. Well, it is a type of anger, you know. This is going on. I can't stand it. Why is this lasting? I mean, want to get it over with. It's anger. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Treat it though. Treat it the same way as you would anger. Again, keep breathing through, breathing through, breathing through. And the part of the mind says, you know, how much longer do I have to keep breathing through? Just say, don't ask. Because yeah. <laughs> actually, impatience is the same issue that in dealing with any pain. When you're thinking about how long this pain has been going on and how much longer in the future is it going to last, and I just can't stand it any longer. Stop and remind yourself. Okay, the past pain is gone. Okay. The future pain hasn't come yet. All you have to do is deal with is the pain in the present moment. Makes it a lot lighter. Yes. Following on from that question, it seems a lot of what you're talking about actually applies to any negative emotion or anything. It's not anger yeah. just a book. Yeah. Anger's talk on but right. mm-hmm. fear and just all the negative stuff and what I perceive as negative mm-hmm. seems to uh, is that true? Or right. It's the same pattern. You know, one's you know, analyzing it into its three parts, and then secondly, looking for the allure. Why do you like to you know, feed on this particular issue? And when you can see those things, then it's a lot easier to deal with. You're not overwhelmed by all these things all at once, the mind and the body and the situation outside. Yeah. Yes? If you can learn to project the anger without actually having the anger, because then you know when to stop. You know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, are there other ways you can? I suppose there are, but mm-hmm. it's, is that a legitimate? Or oh yeah. Could still be considered skillful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But again, you have to not be angry in order to be. <laughs> and that, that's the, that's that's the difficult part. Yeah. But learn how to step back from it and. You know, when you're dealing with people, you know, they say that you have to be, you know, if you want to say something really difficult to somebody else, you have to look for the right time and place, which means not only is that person receptive, but also am I in the right frame of mind so I'm not communicating the wrong you know, tone of voice, the wrong physical message. So it requires a lot of skill. But, you know, it's, right speech doesn't mean, you know, sort of sweet, soft speech all the time. It can be, you know, say, look, no, you've crossed a boundary. Make that clear. Yes. Are the majority of monks always able to handle their own anger? <laughs> the majority of monks? <laughs> no. 
the majority of monks um, don't even practice. I mean, much less <laughs> try to handle their own, handle their own anger. Um, it depends on the culture you're in as well. In Thailand, there's a much stronger culture against you know expressing anger, which has its advantages and disadvantages. I mean, the disadvantage, of course, is anger sometimes gets bottled up and then breaks out in unusual ways. Years back, before I was ordained, and this is just not, not just monks, but you know, Asian culture as a whole. Um, I, when I, before I was a monk, I flew. I was teaching in Thailand, came back to the West, and I have to give a few details of my coming back as they're relevant to the story. I was flying on Air France. We flew into Paris. They had just built the Charles de Gaulle Airport. They were just opening it up, and so and we changed planes and flew to London. And arrived in London, nobody's baggage <laughs> made it through the the, the new airport. And there was the, I guess it was the ambassador from Vietnam who was coming to London at the time, was on the plane. So the person on the ground who normally dealt with baggage claims was going to take care of the ambassador's claim. Another ground stewardess was brought in. And there was this long line as we had, everybody had to fill out the forms. And somebody in the line started complaining about what poor service we were getting from Air France. And the stewardess snapped back at him and said, this is not my job, she said. You're lucky there's anyone here right now. And I realized I'm back in the West. <laughs> you know, in, in Bangkok, it would have been in our grounds to us, and we're very sorry. And, and please bear with us. And, you know, nothing would have happened. <laughs> so, so a lot of it has to do with you know, cultural training. That it's not you know, whether you're a monk or not. It's you know, your attitude towards the anger. In your cultural training and how to deal with anger, in in Asia there's a strong sense that if you if you lose it you really lose it you know you've lost the battle, and people's respect for you goes down. Whereas here in the West sometimes it's the person who shows his anger feels he's getting some respect around here after all I'm showing him, and it doesn't work that way. But you know I've been angry since I was a monk. Come on, it's it's, it's a human thing. But it's a question of living in a culture that places a value on controlling your anger and also having the tools to deal with it, you find it gets more and more and more manageable all the time. Yes? Yes? Um, one of the things I struggle with is I try and handle an angry situation skillfully with a genuine intent and motivation. And, um, and then I realize afterwards sometimes I stick with the tension and I just get angry. Mm-hmm. Okay, express, what you express to the other person is one thing. How you're going to be dealing with the anger inside is another. Yeah. And sometimes you have to come back and deal with that. Yeah. And look at the situation and say, okay, what, what do I feel has, has, is still not settled? Yeah. And, and then say, okay, is this the right time to settle it, or should I just put it aside for the time being, mm-hmm. make plans for something to be said in the future? Because yeah. um, often that's what the res- residual anger is, is there's still something that hasn't been properly settled in this situation. And that's normal. And it's a question of looking when will be the right time to say the next thing, what would be the appropriate thing to say. And that's that's a legitimate, you know, thing to think about. And at the same time see, okay, is it still this physical residual sense that I have or is it more just the mental state that feels upset? But um A lot of times situations like this do take time to settle, and, and we're an impatient country. Yeah. Okay, I want my anger to be settled right now. Okay, I'm done with that and go on to the next thing. Well, you know, there's, there are re- long-term issues that also take working with, and it's you know the legitimate part. It's not that you were disingenuous, simply that the situation was not totally resolved at that time. So look at that. Yes.
that's the, the whole, I mean, it's one thing when you're angry and you realize it, mm -hmm. and it's kind of consuming and self-fueling and self mm -hmm. satisfying. Mm -hmm. Well, you want to sit and sit back and ask yourself, um, <clears throat> okay, okay, if if I were to let go of my anger around that thing, what part of me would feel violated? Because sometimes, you know, the, the old anger is, you know, I've, I've felt violated by this particular incident. And if I let go of my anger, I will feel that I'm missing something. Because it's, it's one thing to recognize, okay, this was an injustice or this was a wrong thing to be done. And at the same time, it's something else to say, though, no, I don't need the anger around that. Again, look for why part of you likes to keep the anger focused on that. And why it would say, and why you'd be afraid to let go of the anger around that. And you know, what part of yourself is, you felt would be denied. And they say, well, really, is this something that I want to hold on to? You, know, you can recognize, okay, that was injustice, that was wrong, it should never have happened. But you don't have to have that same churning feeling around it. And again, you use the breath to breathe through that, you know, sort of the physical side of the anger when it comes up. So that will train your body to have a different physiological reaction the next time it comes up. And if you, and there's also the misperception. Say, I will always be angry about this. Yeah. You're angry about it only when you remember. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. I remember when you know yeah. those like uh, really short fuse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So somebody has a maybe a, a costume uh, like a malfunction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also remind yourself that by maintaining the anger does not, by letting go of the anger you're not denying the injustice. We, by, you, for many times we keep the anger because if we felt, without the anger we wouldn't remember that, that that was an injustice. We wouldn't, you know, retain our, sen our sense of having been wronged. And that would, we would feel violated. And once you can make that distinction, it's easier to deal with. There's a question right behind you. Yes. Yes, actually, it's a very close connection because I was thinking that um, when I uh, reacted angry to injustice mm -hmm. in the world, to others, I was sort of thinking about the cause. And <coughs> it often arises from a sense of compassion for the suffering of others. But when I'm angry about an injustice that's done to me, question I wanted to ask, and actually you, you, you said, um, there's a sense of violation of the self. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a very different kind of um, thing to deal with than to deal with a sense of sympathy or empathy or right. identification with the suffering of mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's almost like it's a persecution. You know, mm -hmm. that person has, maybe said before, but he's out to get you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's 
sometimes goes to the very core of the way you perceive of yourself and the very core of the things that you think that you're here on this earth yeah. to, mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. And um, how, how do you deal with that sense of violation? Okay, don't, let's, don't see your anger as something precious. Because again, that's you know, if if the violation is something that you can work against, it's you can't work against it skillfully when when anger is overcoming you. So, and if there's nothing that can, can be done, you are the one who's inflicting the anger on yourself. So either way, it's not it's it's not a useful so not a useful thing. Um, it's actually, well, it's actually, you know, your, your sense of your defense is this anger. And you feel that if I were to drop the anger, I would be defenseless. And it's learning how to dis distinguish the two, that you have other defenses beside the anger. You know, one, realizing, okay, I remind myself, I don't want to ever do that kind of violence against anybody else, that sense of violation. And to if it comes up again, I want to be able to deal with it in a skillful way, rather than losing it. So the anger there is, it's a false sense of security that you're getting from the anger. And remind yourself that you have other ways of protecting yourself, better ways. And that helps to take some of the, what we call the allure of the anger away. injustice to me, but it's mm. something that I can use to push back against what I fear. Mm -hmm. you know, mm. I fear that injustice can happen to me. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that, in, and, and under that is sadness that mm -hmm. conditions are such that mm -hmm. they would happen to mm -hmm. me, or mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. So if you, if I dispel the anger, I'm left with another set of emotional mm -hmm. emotions to deal with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Deal with them in a similar way, okay? Because your prime, your prime question should be: Okay, what should be done right now? What's the best thing to do right now? Um, and if the emotion is getting in the way of seeing that clearly, then you've got to deal with that emotion, whether it's the anger or the sadness or the fear. Again, many times our most skill, unskillful actions are done under fear. You know, you're afraid of somebody you just lash right back at them without thinking. And you've got to. St st this is why having a very strong sense of your inner core that comes with meditation is a very important thing because that helps get help you to step back from those emotions. You know the practice of you know when a distraction comes into the mind, saying just drop it right now. I don't need that. One of the most you know valuable skills that anybody can have. Because, okay, this particular emotion is not helping me right now. If I feed on it, I'm going to be hurting myself. And so and it's not so much a question of laying blame to yourself. It's just being sort of rational and, um, you know, wise in how you protect yourself, really protect yourself. Because many times our ways of defending ourselves are actually harmful to ourselves. So you want to clear the decks as much as you can. So if you take away the anger, okay, there's still there's still the sadness. Deal with the sadness. Deal with the fear. And then you're in a much better position to make a wise choice. Yes. You can use the breath here. I've. You're old enough to remember the Colgate with Gardol commercials, you know? Remember those? Yes. Okay. When you've got the breath energy in your body going well, it's kind of like a, you know, there's that plastic shield that they had, you know? Because, <laughs> you know, our energy bodies are porous, you know? And you can learn how to kind of, when you fill the body with the energy of the breath, you're it's sort of making, you're closing up the pores. 
And when you learn to think of it in that kind of physical way, you've got yourself very well protected. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. and this is when you've just got to get behind your shield and say, you know, okay, that's that's their. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, I'm not quite sure how to ask this question so it doesn't sound philosophical. Mm-hmm. Sometimes going back to the Hebrew and listening to the Hebrew. Um, but when you were talking about the aggregates. Mm-hmm. Fill up your time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, yeah. it's mm. uh-huh. there. Uh-huh. Um, and it's not that I, I'm disbelieving. I'm mm-hmm. just not quite sure. I haven't quite, my mm-hmm. mind hasn't quite figured out, well, what are you giving it up for? Um, well, there's a happiness that comes when you're not clinging to these things. And, you know, they say it's like, you know, the you know the frog coming down telling the fish, hey, you know, there's there's air up there, you know. <laughs> and the fish say, why should I give up this water? And in the case of the aggregates, it's just if you cling to them, there's going to be a lot of suffering. And there's there's suffering there's suffering inherent in clinging to them right now, which you don't see because it's kind of like the background noise that seems to be everywhere. But when you step out of that clinging, you realize, my gosh, there's an awful lot of suffering involved in just you know keeping this show going. Because it's you know what we do, the word for the aggregate kanda. It's a process that we keep going, and there's an awful lot of energy that goes into keeping it going. And the question is, is the energy put into that worth whatever satisfaction we get out of it? Particularly if these things get out of our control, you know, your mind gets out of your control. That's that's really scary. You want to at least be in a position. As a meditator, say, yeah, I'd like to know what's on the other side so I have the right to choose. And at the moment, you haven't seen the alternative, and so you don't, you're not sure. But you can rest assured that if you see the alternative, you're not going to be trapped in the alternative. <laughs> you have the right to choose. Okay, do I want this or do I want that? And invariably, when people see the other, <laughs> they go for that. <laughs> so. so that's why you're giving, that's why you want to give up the clinging. And you know, after you give up the clinging, the aggregates will still be there for a while. But you'll have a much you'll be in a much better position to deal with them. You know, so when so when they're painful, you're, you're not afflicted by the pain. And when they can do when they produce useful thoughts and useful ideas, you can you can make use of them. What about pleasure? I mean, we're talking about people feeling yeah. Yeah, well, the, the image they, that's traditional is like it's the pleasure that you get from the aggregates. It's like the food they give to prisoners. You know? <laughs> the food outside is much better, you know. <laughs> yeah. There's a question back here. Well, as I said, there is a there is a physical side, 
if the mind weren't there, the body wouldn't react, you know. If the mind weren't, you know, sending out these signals, and this is a bad situation, that, and that was, you know, it gets the body into the hormone reaction. Well, it's, the question is, the body comprehends something, or are there subconscious levels of the mind that are comprehending something? The body is giving you signals that you know, subconscious things are going on, but it's up to you to read the signals. And, you know, the body in and of itself, I mean, if you didn't have a mind, what would you be? You'd be dead, right? The body wouldn't react to anything at all. But the fact that you have the mind there that's sending these messages, and then the body reacts in certain ways to it, the body can be a useful sort of signal that you know something has happened in the mind, as I said, and you use the breath to deal with that. You don't think that there's consciousness in the body? I sort of think that consciousness is sort of you know, stored in the body also. Well, you know, you know where, where is your mind? It's your awareness of the whole range of body. And what we're doing as we meditate is, it's kind of like there's, you know, subconscious levels are like something that's below water. And as you're meditating, the water level goes down and you get more sensitive to what's going on in other levels of consciousness. So it's not just the brain. It's your whole awareness. Yes. Um, I just kind of curious what you said about um, you and Larry having a disagreement. <laughs> 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 yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> The issue is, again, learning to deal with the breath skillfully. Because, as, as Larry was saying, you tell Cambridge people that there's a skillful way of breathing, and then they're going to beat themselves over the head because they're not doing it. You know? yeah. um, and in a short term, that's, I think that's, you know, there's a valid point there. But if you're thinking of meditation as a lifelong practice, you're going to have to learn how to deal skillfully with your breath, learn how to adjust it skillfully. When is the right time just to sit and watch? When is the right time to do something about these things? And that, that's a long-term skill. Um, and the whole question of observing self, that's going to be one of the last things you let go of as you practice. And so you might as well teach your observing self to be a skillful observing self you know, before you can let it go. If you just say, you know, I, I, you know I'm not going to have a self... <laughs> That the practice, you know, stops. <laughs> There's got to be some sense of self going on in there that you want to do something skillfully, and you have a motivation to do it. So what you try to do is you take your sense of self and you try to turn it into, you know, through just observing skillful actions and unskillful actions, your observing self becomes a more skillful observing self. And then, then finally, it observes how to let go of itself which is an extremely difficult skill, so you need practice in other more mundane skills. Because some people think that you can short-circuit all the problems. Well, I'll just let go of my sense of self, and that takes care of everything. You know, it's, you know, the, 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 the teaching is a raft, remember? And that's just saying, okay, I don't need this raft in the middle of the river. I mean, <laughs> so you know, wait till you let, you know, wait, let go at the right time, okay? Is that it? Thank you very much. <laughs>